Today on Context, is religion to blame for violence? The combination of religion and violence is almost as old as, well, religion and violence. And just as old as the debate about cause and effect. Is it geopolitics or faith that inflames violence? Join Lorna as she talks with historian Karen Armstrong, whose latest book tackles this ever-timely question. Then meet a Christian church moderator from India who cites the need for freedom of conscience in the world's largest democracy. Karen Armstrong is one of the world's foremost writers on religion. Her books are both scholarly and popular bestsellers. Though once a Roman Catholic nun, she no longer follows any particular faith. Her books include A History of God and, more recently, Fields of Blood, Religion and the History of Violence. It explores the relationship between faith and war. I sat down with Karen Armstrong during her recent stop in Toronto. Karen Armstrong, we're very happy you're with Context. Thank you. We turn on the news. We see violent beheadings. We see murder. We see an Islamic state. We see ISIS. We see the killing of our Canadian soldiers on Canadian soil as an act of terror. And it brings up a troublesome question. Does religion promote violence? Well, the idea that, relig that religion has some kind of explosive inherent aggression in it has been prevalent in the West since the 18th century. It's been called uh, the myth of religious violence. Um, myth not in the sense of something that is absolutely untrue, but uh, something that expresses a timeless truth. It's been called the charter myth of the modern liberal state that separates religion and politics. It was thought that after the Thirty Years' War, which left a third of the population of Central Europe dead, that religion must never again intrude on public life because they thought that the myth was that these wars of the 16th and 17th century had been caused entirely by the theological quarrels of the Reformation. So when people say to you, religion causes violence, what do you think they really mean? Are they going back to those times of the Reformation? They're going back it's, it, to it, the it, Crusades, this, all of those? This is central to our secular consciousness. It's essential to us in the West um, because it, it justifies uh, amaz an amazing change we made when we took religion out of politics. Okay, but we do live in a secular we West, do. for sure. This all boils down to really one issue, and that is Islamic violence. It's frightening people, and it seems that all the questions about violence are pointing to Islam. What do you say about that? Well, I think a lot of this Islamophobia is also endemic in the West. It's been, it's been prevalent in the West that Islam is a violent religion since the Crusades. So when we have a, a beheading of an, uh, of an aid worker, be he British in your country or American, you call that Islamophobia? Uh, when I'm outraged at that? Yes. Uh, the thing is that uh, when the French revolutionaries created the first secular state in Europe, uh, were ardent secularists, in one year uh, they beheaded 17,000 men, women and children in public. Mass violence has been a characteristic of modernity, starting with the French Revolution, going on to the uh, massacre of the Armenians during World War I by the Young Turks, an ardently secularist group, and, and, and proceeding through the horrors of the 20th century. So to harp on to Islam and ignore the violence that secularism has produced seems to be one-sided. You have got a great new article out in the New Statesman where you explain that it is, um, well, as a friend of ours has said, the, the motorcycle, it's the Hells Angels, it's the motorcycle gang of Islam, really, is what ISIS is like. It's a bunch of thugs. It's a, many of them are secularists, too. Um, the, we shouldn't imagine that all these uh, hordes are inspired entirely by Islamic fervor. A significant number, it's hard to tell how many, seem to be, have been socialist Baptists from Saddam's former regime and members of the army, Saddam's army, that was disbanded by the US when they arrived in Iraq. And are, they are uh, outraged with, with, the, with the Iraq war. In a sense, it's an outgrowth of the Iraq war. Their presence of these professional soldiers explains 
why ISIS is so successful on the battlefield against highly trained troops. So these are secularists. And one of the things that we have to see throughout history, wars that we now, from our secular vantage point, dub religious, such as the Crusades, were also imbued with a whole lot of other political and what we would now call secular matters. One of the things that I have loved what you have taught us in your historical writing is that long before we had religion, we had war. We had human nature stealing from people. It was theft over food. Uh, well, I think we had religion before then. We've always had religion. Religion. And tell us why we've always had because religion. we're meaning-seeking creatures. We, if if we don't find uh, invest our lives with some kind of significance, uh, we fall very easily into despair. The argument I always say is that dogs don't seem to spend a great deal of time agonizing about the canine condition or what will happen to them in the afterlife, but we do, and we have to live with the knowledge of our own mortality. Write the first documents of our species in the. Lascaux Caves, 17,000 years old. Some of these cave paintings go back 30,000 years ago. Uh, they are works of art. They, are also the, they, they were also used in some form of cult. So from the very first, religion and art profoundly interconnected uh, to invest our lives with, with, with meaning. meaning. And the other thing you point out to us is that the human condition has always needed a repair job. First it was stealing food, making a class system so society could advance, and, I, and you see how everything was always on an evolution of improvement. Improvement, but it's always caused suffering. Our civilization has been hard won. Every single pre-modern civilization, before we, in, in, we industrialized our societies, had as the basis of its wealth uh, and its economy, uh, agriculture. And in every single civilization before the modern period, whether we're talking about the Middle East, China, uh, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, a tiny aristocracy um, comprising not more than 5% of the population, uh, supported by a band of retainers, subjugated 90% uh, of the peasants, took their agricultural surplus away for them, kept them in penury at subsistence level in serfdom, and uh, use this wealth to fund their cultural achievements. Which we are the benefits of today. Yes. Now, Thomas Merton, the American Trappist monk, said that where, this is a form of structural violence, when the structures of society inflict pain and suffering on the, a vast number of people. And any one of us who benefit from this system uh, are implicated in that suffering. And uh, historians tell us that without this iniquitous system, human beings would probably not have advanced much beyond subsistence level or primitive level because it created a privileged class that could develop the arts and sciences on which progress developed. So this is a, the dilemma of civilization. You point out to us uh, the foundations of all the great religions, and they all needed a state to make them great. Yes, no state has, uh, no re religion has ever become what we call a world tradition, a world faith, without the support of a powerful, dynamic, expand expanding state or empire. All through the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, the notion of the scapegoat is used. And you, you point out that that was common in, in other Mesopotamian religions. It's then. a common religious theme. And so this idea that blood must be shed for the mistakes, for the sin. Uh, it's not only that. The high priest would bring two goats into the temple on the Day of Atonement. And on one, he would sacrifice it for the, to make atonement for sin. On the other goat, he would lay his hands upon it and transmitting all the sins of the people onto this little animal and then driving it out into Which the wilderness. Which is what we use that as a metaphor for Jesus and driving it's out gone. into the wilderness. The sin is gone. And, and he would take the sins away, placing the blame for sin elsewhere. And I think that when we make a scapegoat of religion, we are not always looking at all the other factors that have also driven us into rage and warfare and oppression. You make the very good point that people have always wanted to put significance to their motives. And so they reach for the God. They reach for religious narrative. Is, is that been at the core 
of how religion has gotten co-opted for, for wars, for violence. Well, that's not all that religion does. You know, harping endlessly on how violent it's been forgets the, to, to show that uh, religion has often been the only voice it, that has risen in protest to the structural violence of the agrarian regime, right from ancient Mesopotamia. The prophets of Israel, very harsh words for people who said their prayers nicely, uh, keep, I mean, keeping a, a private spirituality, but neglecting the plight of the poor and the oppressed, because these are matters of sacral import. Jesus was a deeply political figure. Uh, that doesn't mean that his message was all about politics, because religion and politics in the pre-modern world were so fused that trying to separate religion would be from it would be try, like trying to take the gin out of the cocktail. The polarization of our world uh, in, makes it clear that unless we now learn to make room for the other and not love our enemies, as Jesus said, love the stranger, says uh, Leviticus, unless we learn now to, to take that ethos seriously, it's not just a nice spiritual thing to do, it's essential for the survival of our species. Well, Karen Armstrong, I want to thank you for the work you've done on fields of blood, religion and the history of violence. It's been a very helpful book, and um, we'll be sure to let our viewers know how they can win a copy of an autographed copy of Karen's book. And um, I just want to thank you very much for thank being you very with much. Context. Thank you. When we come back, Joseph D'Souza and living out faith in the often violent multi-faith mix that is India. Context with Lorna.com and enter to win at Lorna's Books this great read, Fields of Blood, Religion and the History of Violence by Karen Armstrong. I picked this book for learners, so only enter if you're serious about learning. Winning this book will help you understand what people did with religion as an organizing force. It's an important read through the history of the world, so win this free copy of this volume uh, by clicking into contextwithlorna.com and enter to win there at Lorna's Books. To add your voice, call us at 1-800-215-4913. Email us at comments at contextwithlorna.com or reach us by Facebook or Twitter. The military force of this group uh, calling itself uh, ISIS uh, will be defeated by force of arms in all likelihood. Uh, I expect it would morph into something else and resurface. But the hatred that it's built upon, the fear that it's built upon, will only be defeated by uh, love. And uh, if, if we love our enemies, uh, it will confound them. They don't understand that. The reality is the people who should be afraid the most, the, the victims of this, uh, the people from Mosul who were attacked, are not expressing fear. Uh, so I come away encouraged that uh, when the terrorists, their weapon is fear. And when the response is love, they have been defeated. And we can only defeat them by uh, letting uh, the perfect love of Jesus drive the fear from our hearts. And, and that's, that's been a lesson uh, that I've learned personally, and I, I find it very encouraging. I hope it's encouraging to people back home. We, we have nothing to fear. Uh, we, have, uh, we have love. India has been a hotbed for religious violence. Here to explain is Sheldon Neal with your N60. Thank you, Lorna. Well, nowhere is religion more a part of a country's culture than in India. With almost 1.3 billion people, it's the world's largest democracy. All of the world's great religions flourish and fight for their rights in India. With the Hindu majority, India is also home to Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jains. 
This diversity of, belie of beliefs and practices is further complicated by India's caste ideology. The caste system is a means of social stratification where a person's social class is determined by birth. At the bottom of this hierarchy are the Dalits, or untouchables, who endure discrimination and exploitation throughout India. Well, what to do when the very religious system you are born into promotes violence and human rights abuses? Joseph D'Souza is the founder of the Dalit Freedom Network, and he works with the All India Christian Council on human rights issues in India. Born into a Christian family with an upper caste origin, Joseph D'Souza campaigns worldwide for the marginalized and oppressed, and he knows firsthand the reality of religious violence. I spoke with Joseph D'Souza during his recent stop in Toronto. Joseph, it's wonderful to have you at uh, Context TV. I think you need to explain for us what a Dalit is and why your organization needs to exist for them. The Dalits are uh, the outcasts of Indian society and they've been there for a couple of thousand years. And how many are there? There are close to 250 million of them at the present time. And they're spread all across India. Pre-election, Prime Minister Modi said this coming decade is going to be the decade for the Dalits. And we, we're waiting to see how it unpacks. Because, so he's talked about the Dalits pre-election. The previous Prime Minister went on national platform 2007 and said, the only comparison to uh, what we are facing in terms of the Dalit problem and untouchability is the apartheid system in South Africa. So there is institutionalized, not legal, though the constitution uh, banned the practice of untouchability. Society as an institution has institutionalized a discriminatory system against people whom they perceive as not as good as themselves because of where they were born. And then they're exploited and there is violence against them. There is abuse, there is trafficking, and all kinds of discrimination that's going on. And we, along with civil society, work for freeing these people and uh, empowering these people to live as humans with dignity. So your work then has covered education, jobs, empowering women, anti-trafficking. Tell us about what in your faith in Jesus Christ motivates that? There's a one part of scripture and Christ's teaching, Lorna, that motivates us and something that Mother Teresa used to talk about. And that is, we see Jesus in each of the Dalits. And when we touch the Dalits, we are touching Jesus. And one day when we stand in front of God, we're going to say, when did we clothe you? When did we free you? When did we remove you from slavery? When did we educate you? And Jesus will say, when you did to one of the least of these, you did it unto me. When we are doing mission, we know we are also ministering to Christ, not just the people themselves. And what drives us really, uh, the love of the love of God and the love of Jesus and, and the love of people. And Indians love India. Uh, and the reason we love India is because Jesus loves India. It has not always been easy to be a follower of Jesus in India as of late. Um, your prime minister's government uh, party has a history of being violent towards religious minorities, including Christians. What is your future? Well, we're going to wait and watch. We believe Modi needs to be given time because in his Independence Day speech, he talked about a 10-year moratorium on communal, which is religious violence, and caste violence. So he wants a 10-year moratorium in country. We would have preferred if he would have said a lifelong moratorium, not just a 10-year moratorium on any kind of violence. And so there are extremist elements in India who don't think twice about targeting Christians and uh, attacking them. And always the excuse is uh, Christians are engaged in forced and fraudulent conversions. And then, you know, there's not a single court case where any Christian group has been convicted where there is anti-conversion laws in some of the states in the last 30 years. But the propaganda continues and then the violence continues and they keep on attacking. And so as we look at this, one of the big questions in our mind is, is Modi going to be able to control these fanatical extremist groups that resort to violence and attacking innocent people? And do you believe the word conversion is greatly misunderstood in India? 
very much. The word conversion is misunderstood because it is seen as something that has been manipulated and done by an external force to people against their wishes or against their own choices. We don't believe in those conversions. I mean, the way I read the New Testament, it's better to talk about freedom of belief. And India has a constitution that very category gives an individual the right to believe or not believe or change belief uh, according to their conscience. And what happens when people turn to Christ, it's a choice between them and God and Christ, not us. What we are trying to do is, and, and, and India can't prevent it unless they want to kill all of us, what we are trying to do is to just be disciples of Christ and followers of Christ, and Christ tells us very clearly, go and teach about your faith to all the people. And that's all that we do. And we don't go and tell people to go and bomb their neighbor or hate their neighbor or go and destroy the country. We are saying, let's make India great. Let's build India. Let's love our neighbor. And we tell them about the love of God for people. So that's not about conversion. This is about trying to be Christian, free Christians in India, without any agenda of any political power or takeover or change of a nation or anything like that. It is so important that we link the person's heart with the heart of God and de-link it from political motives. How do you do that? The way to do that is to make sure that we as Christians are you know, walking in with 100% integrity and we don't bring politics and faith together. And there's this confusion when politics and faith comes together then there is massive confusion. Is it possible for me to be a true Christian and a totally patriotic Indian? Absolutely. In fact, the Bible does not allow me to be a Christian in India and be non-patriotic or unpatriotic or work against the interest of India. That is what we have to communicate, that being a Christian in any country and being a a patriotic citizen of country is part of our biblical heritage. Unfortunately, because of colonialism and everything else, there's a lot of misunderstanding. You know, it's my belief that Christians, wherever they are, and especially in my country, they make the best citizens. It's quite a claim, but you do have um, a small, uh, well, 3,500 people, over 100 schools. You've taken over 1,500 people out of human trafficking. I want to know what fuels you spiritually. What is your prayer life like that allows you to lead in that kind of climate? I couldn't uh, do this without Jesus. And uh, I have to be honest, every day for me is about def uh, depending upon the Lord Jesus and his empowerment and his grace and his power. And ultimately for me, it's all about the love of Christ. The love of God for me is such an important part of my spiritual makeup. I experience God's love daily. More importantly, I know this same Christ loves everybody else. He loves my enemies. He loves India. Reverend D'Souza, thank you very much. Welcome. Now it's time to find out what you think. Sheldon, over to you. Thank you, Lorna. We've got a question for you at home. Do you think religion is to blame for conflict in our world today? Why or why not? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us by phone at 1-800-215-4913 or email us at comments at contextwithlorna.com. You can also reach us by Facebook or Twitter. I think that it definitely plays a big part in it. A lot of the countries that are conflicting are very religious. I don't think so. I believe uh, religion in general are, are teaching to help people to be, you know, better in life and then to do, to treat everybody well. And uh, I would think that um, the misinterpretation and the extremists are the ones to, to blame. I don't think so. I think the education level, I can blame it for this one here. So non-educated people doing all this conflict in the world. And as Gandhi said, if you want to uh, control non-educated people, the only way to control them is by religion. But because you are non-educated people. So education, jobs, this is the only two things I can blame for all the conflict all of us. That's my opinion. 
No, religion is not to blame. It's the men of the world and the women of the world who do not believe in peace. I think religion is to blame for a lot of the conflict going on in the world, especially within the Middle East right now. Absolutely. Especially the extremists and the radicalists. Uh, religion that helps an individual and spirituality is good, but there is a limit and you can't go too far. And absolutely, I think it's the issue right now. There wouldn't be any conflict in the world if we followed the religion we believe in. That is the misinterpretation of the religion. That said, no matter what religion you follow through, I don't believe any religion says go and fight, kill innocent people, rob from someone in the name of religion. I don't think any religion says that. When we come back, some thoughts on getting along in a world with one God and so many beliefs. Click context with Lorna.com to access exclusive web resources. Do a topical search on a subject you need to know. There's blogs, articles, links, and previous episodes. Life beyond the headlines. That's context with Lorna.com. Coming soon on Context, I sit down with Anne Rice, the author who made vampires famous, and look at her character Prince Lestat and what her own relationship with Jesus is like today. You won't want to miss it. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates, family harmony and philanthropy, helping you help others. the differences in other people is one reason why religions can be manipulated into violence. Reading the story of Jesus, the respect and dignity he afforded everyone, especially the disadvantaged and downtrodden, is more than a blueprint for religious reconciliation. It's a reminder that a true relationship with God is an inner reality outside politics, worldly power, or money. It's a useful template for everyday living. Today's guests were great reminders of mistakes made along the route. And we have a free copy of Karen Armstrong's book, Fields of Blood, for you to win when you head to contextwithlorna.com and enter Lorna's books. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching. Join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. It's the religion. I think it's people not accepting one another's um, right to believe in what they want to believe in. Everybody believes in a higher power, but what name they put to that higher power and why there should be conflict over it, um, they should be more accepting of one another and, their, and have the right to have their own beliefs. I don't believe religion is to blame, but I do believe religion is used as an excuse. It is disgusting and repugnant to me that all the universal um, themes of religion talk about loving your neighbor and treating others the way you'd like to be treated. Uh, the fact that somebody could take that and pervert it into being able to justifiably kill someone, uh, to me, is, is, is a repugnant use of religion. So I don't believe religion is responsible, but I definitely think religion is used, and I think it's a ridiculous excuse because if you look at all religions, you'll know that it's all about loving and caring and not necessarily trying to kill someone with a Bible in your hand or a justification from some god that they don't recognize. It's not too late to send us your comments, voicemail, email, Facebook, or Twitter. The conversation continues.